Hi everyone. I have a real treat for you today. Um, I'm going to be interviewing Geraldine Burns, who I consider to be really the matriarch of um, the benzodiazepine community. So welcome Geraldine. Thank you for having me, Jocelyn. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad that you agreed to do this because I know you don't love doing like camera interviews. So <laughs> right. I like to be behind the scenes. <laughs> yeah, 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 with your podcast and all that. So, well, um, just by way of introduction, Geraldine Burns has been a pioneer in helping to get the word out about the potential dangers of benzodiazepines. In 1999, she started the first internet support group for people wishing to withdraw from tranquilizers or already off and having problems. She is dedicated to the responsible and informed use of addictive prescription drugs. She was instrumental in having Professor Heather Ashton, Professor Emeritus from the University of Newcastle, write her manual, Benzodiazepines, How They Work and How to Withdraw, also known as the Ashton Manual. This manual has now been translated into 13 other languages. In 2006, she launched the website benzobookreview.com um, after she was given the rights by 11 internationally known authors of books that had been written on the subject of tranquilizers, of which some were no longer being published. She worked to have some of them revised and updated so we could bring the most up-to-date information on tranquilizers and sleeping pills to the public. She has done a number of radio shows, including Prescription Addiction Radio, the Frankie Boyer Show, Dr. Gloria Gilbert's Your Health Matters Show, and Blog Talk Radio. In 2018, she launched her podcast show, Benzodiazepine Awareness, with Geraldine Burns, which is also on YouTube. So, and that's probably really only part of your history. I mean, we could probably read a, a few pages <laughs> on your... I'm now one of the old timers. It's funny because there were so many before me and a lot of people have forgotten about them, you know, that we're very grateful for the ones in the UK, in Australia, when um, going to Kanad from Tranks, which is now Reconnection, Shirley Trickett that wrote some of the Benzo books over in um, the UK. I mean, there were so many that came before me and look at, we're still fighting this. That's the sad part. It is. I mean, it was basically the end of the 80s, early 90s, right, when Ashton wrote that manual? Yeah. And, and I had asked her, you know, it's funny, at the time, she's just so giving. When I contacted Heather, I had asked her, would she just write for this book that I was trying to put together? And I was trying to do an international effort, and I was getting um, doctors from Sweden, England, the UK, different places. And um, when I asked her, she said, well, what would be different than Shirley Trickett's book? And I said to her, well, that's really writing to, uh, uh, for, to patients, you know, saying that this is real. I need something from medical professionals to validate what we're going through. And she agreed. And so when it came in the mail, I was shocked that it was three chapters. I mean, I thought I was expecting a couple of pages. Um, because some of the doctors that wrote for me wrote maybe two or three pages. That was it. Like, okay. And hers, when it came, and then in speaking with different other Benzo uh, survivors, it was, let's get it out there by itself, alone. And we did, because we needed something to validate what we were going through, that somebody could take to their doctor from somebody like Heather Ashton, you know? And that's how it started. And we used to do it just out of my house. You know, people were sending you know, checks and, you know, I'd have to mail it out every day. And I was still pretty sick at the time. So my poor husband would have to run or, you know, my son was getting his license at the time. And it was, it's a lot of work, you know, we'd have to go get them copied. And then the next progression of the Ashton Manual was Dr. Grisanti, who was instrumental in saying, you need to work bigger, better. What do you, you know, this problem is still around. And then he, um, went through this whole thing to teach me how to, uh, we uh, turned everything into PDFs and into digital and started the Benzo book review so that anywhere in the world, somebody could click a button and get the download instantaneously. Now they don't have to wait for it to be shipped. But a lot of people still want the softbound book. So, you know, that money I would send over to Heather. Any of the proceeds would go to her. And initially she would, you know, she was so for the benzo cause she was giving it to the benzo organizations over there yeah. you know and now that she's passed away you know the money goes over to her son to continue her legacy 
Oh, and I would say I wasn't aware of that. So he's continuing the work in various so, ways. I'm not sure what John's doing. He's still in the background right now. There's, there's still a lot since Heather passed away, but I still send it. And what I had asked him at one point, would you like me to take it and put it towards this particular benzo cause? But he said, not at that moment. They were still doing some stuff. So I'm sure he's still very much involved over there. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, uh, that's, that's her legacy and it belongs to her family. Yeah, and you know what I find so interesting as you talk about that? I mean, I'm not familiar with these people that you mentioned who came before you, but in hearing the what you did, you know, and be out of necessity as we all have, because we all have this need for the medical community to validate us um, in order to really prevent a lot of this harm and to get the help we need. Right. I, I find it interesting that even still, how incumbent it was on you as somebody who was injured and still ill to to do so much of this yourself really right. and and i mean i'm obviously i'm we're i think i don't think we can count the number of people who are beholden to professor ashton for what she has done because it doesn't just impact the benzodiazepine community um basically every withdrawal protocol that is legit is based on professor ashton's manual right, right? but and yet still it was it was still like this patient-led constantly like you know the thing and, and you know one of the things heather would say because we we've added since we first put it out um she never wanted to use like a lawnmower manual because we found out that sometimes people would bring it into their doctor and they would look at it and see every two weeks cut 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 mm -hmm. she didn't like that but she said geraldine if i do it the way it should be done it would be over 500 pages so she said it's a guide i want it used as a guide so, you know, we try to sell that to people because so many come back and their doctors are forcing them to taper every two weeks. And she yeah. really understood that it was a, a symptom-based taper. That's how it should be done. She did. And she made, I felt like she made that very clear in the manual. You know, when I really broke it down to do my video series that I did yeah. on it, it's like, no, she is, she is clearly stating here, like, there are no hard and fast rules. Um, and I think that's hard for a lot of people, patients and doctors alike to wrap their heads around because you want something concrete, like certain, but there is no certainty in this. Um, that's the nature of benzodiazepines. There, everybody is so different. There are a million and one different ways that this can manifest and a million and one different ways to taper. <laughs> right. And the reason I, you do it, I do it, any one of us do it, it's not for ourselves. It's too late for us. It already happened to us. We're doing it for those behind us. You know, so when we go into the state house to stop to talk for legislation, we're not in there for ourselves. It's done. It's been done to us already. And you know, here I am. I was 33 when I got put on them. I'm going to be 66. Why am I still doing this? You know, because it's it, it's you know when we started when I started the first support group, it was like oh, there's 24 of us. There's 100. There's 200. You know, at the time when I left to go do the benzo book project there were four thousand and we're thinking wow four thousand around the world now you look in this hundreds and thousands it, you know there are support there are organizations in australia in in um you know in england in sweden in you know in japan they're doing stuff we still in the united states it's very upsetting that we don't have anything and aside from one of my goals was to always have um, you know, a project where people could listen over and over again to success stories, which is how the podcast came about. Although years ago, I wanted to do it with DVDs, but podcasts have come now and it's a great way to do it. But I, my other thing I wanted was every hospital had like a little mini tranks. There was a doctor who contacted me years ago and he said, Geraldine, how do I find other doctors like myself that know that you know, the problem with these drugs. I'm like, you're a gold find. And he wanted to start like a Tranks uh, North America with Canada and the United States, which when you look, even when I get audits for the Ashton Manual, Canada and the United States are probably the two biggest um, countries that you're getting the audits out of. So I would love at some point that every hospital has where you can go and you are fully recognized when you go for support. That would be and fantastic. It would be. I mean, I love that it's online because I was so agoraphobic back then. I couldn't have left the house. So, yeah. so for me, doing it online was great. Um, but families 
need to be able to understand if, if we need the support of our families and our friends to know that this is real. Yeah, I mean, I constantly get that on uh, my channel is people asking, is there support for friends and families? Where can we go for support? And I mean, there have been various things at times here and there, like a Facebook group, but they've, they've come and gone. And it's, it's vital, I, I think, that um, the doctors are involved because they're the ones who can speak to the friends and families and tell them this is a legitimate problem and this is how we deal with it. This is like the official way to kind of help your loved one in a sense right. um, because then people are just, they're kind of scrambling and they're well-intentioned, but they're like, well, maybe you should go to a detox center or maybe you just need to get out and, you know, right. and, you know, and they're trying, but they're trying and failing, unfortunately, because they don't, they don't have the information. No. And, and, and it just makes it so much better when the medical profession is behind us. So what's going on that some know and some don't. And I would say here in the United States, it's still, I mean, I'm in Boston and it's still not recognized. When we go in to speak in at the state house, I am telling you what, what, unless you're in that room, when you're coming up, these doctors that still after all these years, they won't admit it and they will come in 100% against you know, doing anything. They won't stay and listen. They won't listen to anybody's stories. So the only one they hear is mine. Mm. And then they're out the door after they speak. Now that to me, and, and they're asked, they're actually asked to stay and speak, which I find, wow. Well, well the first year we did it, uh, one doctor stayed behind and he listened to every story. And I thought he has a heart, you know, but the other one's out, right out the door. You know, and so. yeah, and for those of you who don't know, what Geraldine's talking about is um, some legislation that she and her son, right, um, drafted and um, have presented um, before the, well, Massachusetts legislature. And basically, it, it's pretty basic legislation. I know you started out with more in mind to protect patients, but really, it's just about informed consent. It's, it's literally just about getting doctors to tell their patients basically what the FDA has come out now and said. <laughs> and yet yeah, they have not that for years. Yeah. <laughs> right. got it. And you know, I it is. It's, and we're asking for so little that I would have thought they'd jump on board at some point because it is so good. Informed consent, short-term reason, short-term prescription. Um, we want a patient symptom-based taper. We don't want guidelines set up. And, and I understand that that was one of their problems because from when we, when the bill is written, when my son and I sat down and we did the bill and then it has to go to house council and it gets changed there. So language got changed and even I didn't like some of it. But then when we went in the second time, uh, the part that was the, I felt I will not do this unless it's in there was anybody on the long term that no one, and as you know, in the group, so many times people are just cold turkey by their doctors. Uh, and to me, that's a crime. So we wanted that in there, that no one, you know, would be taken off if they did not want to be. Because yeah. you're asking them to go through a lot. You know, yeah. they should be informed. Here's what can happen when you withdraw. They should be informed before they're put on. They should be informed if they've been on long-term, you know, what would happen if they came off. And so we wanted the right that if they were on long term, they did not want to come off. That's their choice. And nobody could ever force them off. That was important. And the second time it got left off. And then the third time, and I have to admit, I was, I didn't read it fully. It got left off again. So when we, we're going to have to go in again, we'll be filing a fourth time. And this time we'll make sure that that's in there. Yeah, that is so important, and yeah. because that's that's really honestly, I think one of the worst things we see, in in you know as we go through it and interact with all these people are those who, who are forced off off their will, particularly after years of use, yeah. their bodies have completely altered, right, and and now yeah. they're being forced to just suffer in absolute hell because their doctor just simply doesn't want to prescribe yeah. it. And they're they're working, they have families and all of a sudden their lives got turned upside down. And I, again, that's so irresponsible. It and, is. And, and even just the, the informed consent thing, that, that's just basically legislation asking doctors to do their job. Like that's all it is. It's like, hey, do your job. <laughs> just do and it if you right. don't have time, hand them, you know, have something all typed up, hand it to them, say, you know what, yeah. I want you to go over this first. And if you're still comfortable and you want the prescription, I'm going to give it to you. Something needs to be done. And this is why we all, we've been so harmed. And of course, the other thing that I'm a, a big thing when I go in and I speak at the state house is as women, 
we have had, um, I know I had perfect periods until I was given Ativan, and I noticed my periods changing, 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 so that by 41, I have a hysterectomy. I still keep thinking I'm gonna get off Ativan someday, I want more children, and I have a hysterectomy, because now I'm bleeding three weeks out of the month, and nobody can figure out why. And so I have a hysterectomy, and my first question afterwards was, um, what was wrong with my uterus? And the doctor said it was in perfect condition. And it wasn't until six months after my hysterectomy, I finally meet a new gynecologist, and she tells me, you know, I'm on one of the most addictive drugs ever made. Even though, you know, we know these drugs cause dependence, that's the word she used. And when we went into the state house the very first time, every woman who spoke had either had a hysterectomy, a DNC, had severe menstrual issues, and yet we see girls um, on the groups when they're tapering that their periods become more normal. And the other one is they lose their menstrual period. So there was a girl here in Massachusetts. She, it took her three years after stopping Clonopin, and she finally got her menstrual cycle back and was able to have one child. Oh, wow. And there was another one that came to speak. She had lost her menstrual cycle and after coming off of Clonopin, got it back in 13 months. So this is how potent these drugs can be. And of course, joking around, I always say to my son when we go in to speak, I said, you know, I am going to say that if this was men and something happened to their testicles and they had to be removed, you would have seen them do something about this right away. But because it's us and you can't see our uterus, no one's paying attention. Yeah. Well, like, don't, don't do it. Don't say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, just because that's, I mean, just in my experience, that's kind of how the misogyny of the, the medical profession is anyway. It's like, oh, there's something wrong with your uterus. Let's rip it out. And it's like, no, I think I'd like to keep it actually. Yeah. You know? But you know, I've got letters from other women that same thing happened to them. They, they had children, they were put on benzos. I mean, I got put on after I had my second child, I'm in the hospital. I said, something's wrong. I don't feel right. And I'm given out of hand. I ended up because I delivered my daughter so fast, you know, I delivered very quick and um, there wasn't time for anything. And I ripped and I was given an antibiotic. I was given, I think, one quick little antibiotic when it happened, but nothing after. And a year later, we found out I had an infection all that time. And once I took an antibiotic, I felt alive again. So now what do I do? I stopped taking the Ativan. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know you can't just stop taking it. So I, I'm going into severe withdrawal. And when I called my doctor, she said not to question her again, to go back on Ativan and take it for the rest of my life and to go to an ER the next time I feel something like that. I could have been free a year after being on them. Wow. So. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, I didn't know that you were 33 when you got on, and, and I, I was 32, and it was right after I'd had a baby as well, and I mean, not like right, right after, but a few months after, um, yeah. so there's kind of that parallel, it's, I mean, yeah. I held up, I held up, I had Leander in March, and I held up till August, I kept thinking, I don't want to take a drug, I'm home with two kids, but what is it, she kept telling me, it's a chemical imbalance, I'm like, how do you know? I was a working full-time mother. I wanted to go back to my job. I know. I was told it was postpartum. Four months after I had a baby. <laughs> it was yeah. postpartum, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, And we know other women that the same things happen. You know, you just have to look for, for what's wrong. And, you know, the fact that I lost that right to have more children was infuriating later on when you find out that all I had to do was stop taking that medication that was causing it. And I don't know if you know this, Jocelyn, but there is an article that came out one year after benzos hit the market um, showing the effect that they have on a woman's menstrual cycle. So that was back, I think, in 1961. So 1961, that is, yeah, I haven't heard about that, but I know that there's been new research because when I was given, well, so when I went to get off, it was to have another baby. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a miscarriage and I was told it was a teratogen at the time. That's part of why I try to get off so fast because it was like, oh, within the first 12 weeks, it's a teratogen. You have to be so careful. Well, then a new research has said, well, it's not necessarily a teratogen, but it, it can cause what the medical community terms spontaneous abortions, which are miscarriages, which is what I had, yeah. which is what yeah. many other women I know had you know, they try to get off too fast. They were like me and they all had miscarriages. Uh. Um, and just like you, yeah, I, I wanted to have more kids and that 
that's not going to happen now. And, yeah. you know, even though luckily I didn't have a hysterectomy or anything like that, it's just not, I'm 42, you know, I can, I can now, you know, I had been on benzos for quite some time and then it took a long time to taper. And now I'm just to the point where I can take care of myself. I can take care of the kids I have. Um, but anything else would just be beyond me at this point, you know, even if I could handle a pregnancy. So, yeah. and, and, and you know what, but at least I, at least I've, I've had a family to some extent. There are so many women out there who are put on these so young, they didn't know. And now they're in their thirties or they're in their forties and they're disabled and they've never been able to have children. And, and that's just been stripped from them. There, it, that, that option has been taken away from them. Yeah, that's, the I think that's heartbreaking when I talk to the girls that they're still tapering. They're in their you know, mid to late thirties and they're like, I'm losing my window. Yeah. I mean, the long-term effect that these have, and so why are we still doing this? I think it's, it's one of these things that it's, it's hard to ever get away from it. So you change how you're doing it. You go from a support group to, uh, you know, doing, you know, sell, getting Heather's books out there to doing legislation to doing podcasts. I mean, what else can we keep doing? I mean, I think this is such a crisis, not just in this country, but all over the world. And yet, I'm always very careful to say I am not against these drugs. There is a purpose for them if they are used responsibly. Well, and I think the important message for me is it's never been my goal to get people off of benzodiazepines. My goal right. is to help people. And right. if that means helping someone get off of their benzodiazepine, then that's what I want to do. And if it means that they need to stay on it because they don't have the strength to go through hell and potentially be disabled for years, then that's my goal too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And that should be the doctor's goals too. <laughs> yeah. well, right. you know, I did a podcast with my childhood friend. No, I had known her since kindergarten. She's been on Benzos now 40 years. So in her early 20s, she was put on. And it's quite an interesting story because she was bright and had her own school and loved children, was engaged to be married, and she's on these drugs, she's on Klonopin, and doesn't know why she's acting different and things are changing. So she cancels her marriage. She's now, you know, 66, you know, never got married, never had children, and lost a lot of friends. And so the, the whole thing was that was never leave a friend behind, because I'm sure we all have know people now that they started to act a little differently. They're, you know, withdrawing from society. And I make sure we, we, you know, if I don't talk to her, I try to stop by her house and she may never get fully off. She knows that. And now she has a very good doctor here in Boston and she may only get down a certain amount, but she's definitely cognitively better. And so you're right. It's never, it's up to the person what they want. We can't give advice. It has to be them. You know, we had our own journey. They have to have their own journey. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I felt, I've always felt like, well, because you were saying, so what do we do? You, you started this support group and you started this website and you, you got the Ashton manual out there, which is huge for me. You know, it was like, okay, well, we need a nonprofit. We need some sort of legitimate voice out there, you know, speaking to the public about this. Right. And, but finally, finally now, and um, you did such a great job of, of bringing this out when you interviewed Dr. Stephen Wright the other day, uh, yeah. it, is that we finally do have doctors yeah. who are together as a group coming out and, and talking about this problem. And so it's not just the patients, right? <laughs> it's, it's actually some it's, medical. I think that the, um, the, the, that website for the Benzer Reform, for that, the Alliance is phenomenal. In fact, I got a call the other day and somebody was frantic. You know, if we could have one thing for this family to look at, what will it be? And I said, oh, send them to benzoreform.org. Have them listen to Dr. Stephen Wright's podcast. I mean, this can save a life. And it did. It saved uh, this family was going to put this woman in a rehab and that saved them. That wow. saved her. I think yeah. it would have killed this girl because she was so weak and sick. Oh my gosh. So yeah, there are, that is a phenomenal organization. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. And they're really, they're really laser focused on their goals, you know, of, of getting the, the prescribing practices in the United States to change. Right. Um, and of course the, you know, the nonprofit, the Benzo Info Coalition that I co-founded, you know, they've yeah. been so great at just getting out to the public in general. And they were instrumental really in getting the FDA to 
you know, actually say something about this, which I think right. is going to be, along with the ASHA manual, is going to be one of the greatest resources now for patients. Yeah, I mean, between BIC, between Benzo Reform, BenzoInfo.com, you know, things are happening. You know, there are finally, because years ago, it was other countries doing it. What did we have out of the United States at the time? You know, my little support group. And now it's, there's so much more. And it will get bigger. And it's so sad to see hundreds of thousands of people going through these groups that when will it stop? When will it get better? Well, and I think part of the reason why it's so hard in the US is because you oftentimes, like what you're doing with your legislation, you have to do things state by state. You yeah. know, so uh, but luckily, if, if Boston, if Massachusetts does this, it'll be, uh, it'll have an impact on legislation in other states too, because we'll kind of follow your lead. But yeah. it is, it's like, you know, there's no, you can't do this like really on a federal level. Um, no, and so you that's can't. And, and what I was hoping with legislation, so we have legislation in Massachusetts, we have uh, uh, New Jersey, and I believe Hawaii, and I'm not sure if any other state has done it yet. I think there are a few trying to do it. Yeah, but they're working think, on it. Without even, in all this time, I thought, okay, they're going to stop paying attention. So now with the new FDA black box, I'm like, okay, this is going to be what it's going to take, you know, to make a change. So we'll see. I hope. I hope. I mean, we'll go in, we'll file again. And this time, at least on our third try, we did make it out of committee and we would have, it would have gone to another committee now to discuss further. But because of COVID, all those bills are pushed to the side. And so the time is going to run out the end of this month and we'll just, we'll do it again. And I, you know, it's like, Four times I got to go in and speak, but I also went in and spoke at uh, Governor Baker's opioid meeting because when I spoke at one of the uh, our um, benzo hearings, uh, I mentioned that my niece died when she was 30 years old from a benzo and an opioid. And the head of that committee is a nurse, was a nurse for that committee. And I got a call the night before Governor Baker's opioid meeting to come in and speak. You know, and so I got three minutes and it did, now you're in a huge, like three, 400 people at this meeting. And, you know, I, I got it in. And actually when I was leaving, I could feel somebody behind me. I'm like, somebody's following me. And actually this, um, this was somebody that his job is to educate doctors. And he said, everything you said is so true. So I'm, I'm actually going to see if we can work with him to do something about educating doctors here. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. And so. you know, I mean, I just look at you and now it's been what, 30 years or something that you've been 33 doing? Years. 33 years. I'll be 66 years. in February and it's like 33 years, 10 of being sick on the drugs, on, you know, on the drugs, then all the years off the drugs being sick, then you get healthy and you look in the mirror and you got older and, and this is why, you know, we do the podcast because, you know, my son had said to me, mom, don't do to my nephew, you know, I've had my nephew since he was three months old. And he's like, don't do to him what you did to us and put benzo people before your family. So I'm very cautious. You know, I've, I've reeled that in. So, you know, it can bring, you know, professionals and stories and filmmakers and, just anybody onto the podcast to listen because a lot of people, you know, I'll get messages that they listen to them at night when they can't sleep, which is great. So I feel like I'm still doing my part. And if I want to take the summer off, it's great. I take the summer off. And, um, you know, right now we'll be doing our 30th episode, hopefully this weekend. And I think it's going to be a very encouraging one because it's someone that's been, uh, was on Ativan for 30 years and he's very healthy very healthy so if that isn't encouraging I don't know what it is yeah and I remember being when I was sick and going on to benzo buddies and looking at the success stories and how crucial that was to me for my hope you know to keep going that it was possible to heal and also I think it's so fantastic that your podcast and just um, tell people real quick what's the name and where can they find it so it's Benzodiazepine Awareness with Geraldine Burns. It's on any podcast app, but it's also on YouTube. So if people go and subscribe, then you'll get a notice whenever a new one comes out. And, um, you know, just you can listen to them. We weren't um, numbering them at first, but I think, you know, the first one I tell my story. The second one I say what I would do, getting ready to taper now, all the mistakes that I know I made. And I, I love my do's and don'ts. I had two episodes of do's and don'ts because it's, what we've all learned over the years, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. 
and what we and, have to really continuously repeat to people over and over again oh, because, because usually I, it's like they you know, start, they're already yeah. make, they're making the mistakes by the time they get to us you know we, we don't catch them quite early enough but because you know one of the things that you'll see somebody take they want to take something to sleep and i think one of the most dangerous products out there is that phenobut oh my gosh Oh, uh, and I, so I mean, I'm warning people. I've tried to say it publicly, and there are a lot of wonderful natural things to help you sleep. Yeah. But that is one that is you're going to go through a withdrawal to come off of that. Oh, it's just awesome. like a benzo. And and it comes in like different formulas, so it'll have different names. Like somebody even just the other day said something to me about, oh, do you know this product? I said no, and it was Phenobut. Um, yeah. and oh yeah that is so yeah, big warning but, so i'm glad we can say that here on, I mean, on you might as well just take yeah. another benzo on top of your benzo exactly exactly yeah. it's so dangerous and i've heard you know there was a married couple once both of them you know that were on benzos both of them took the phenobut and somebody else i warned her up front don't take it she starts with one two then three pills four pills and then you got to go through withdrawal so when somebody says oh it took me you know seven years to recover well tell them all the mistakes you made along those seven years, you know, that you had to come off of benzos and you had to come off of phenobut, you know, so very dangerous product. Yeah, so, and yeah. I think, okay. I, I don't know what your opinion is on this. I used to be kind of very hardcore, like don't do anything, but I, you know, it's, it's highly individual, but I really think most of us got into this mess in the first place because because there's this mindset that you can take something to make it better. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, and when you go through benzo withdrawal, one of the main things you have to learn is that there's, is there's no thing that you take that makes everything better. You have to get away from that mindset. You know, mm -hmm. the, if, if you're going to get better, it's because you have that strength because God's going to heal you, <laughs> you know, and, and, and that's about it. There's, there's not a doctor, there's not a person, there's not a product that's going to heal you. Well, so my belief is, you know, first of all, we know benzodiazepines are amongst the drugs that can harm the gut. So there's that uh, book, the, um, the GAPS diet, the gut oh, psychological yeah. syndrome. Yeah. And so there can be some real harm to the gut. So I've always been honest. I took years to heal. It wasn't until five years when my health turned around when I finally worked with a functional medicine doctor. And I had severe candida because I had tried vegetarian diet, which... You know, for me, only made the candida grow. Um, I had leaky gut and I had malabsorption. I was down to 97 pounds at one point. Oh, wow. So for me, and that was, you know, was the, and, you know my husband's like, wanted to take me to the ER. I'm like, they'll only, they won't find anything wrong. So for me, uh, functional medicine helped. And I did have to take some products to heal my gut. And within three months of healing my gut, I could put weight on. My strength came back. So, and the other thing was, um, I had seen a functional medicine doctor kind of earlier on, but I was so sick I couldn't get back there. I do take magnesium. Now, not everybody can. So I take a, a professional brand of a magnesium glycinate, but I always kind of had muscle cramps in my legs, even when I was younger. And I, I, it just relaxes my, my muscles. So, and one of our uh, people who, uh, that was in the Benzo group, she was a PhD. She did her own research and so there are certain nutrients that we lose going when we take a drug. And so magnesium, it is hard for some, but get it through your diet. So some are too sick to even eat right, but diet is very important. So I tried at the time when I, at five years, when I went to a functional medicine doctor, I was trying to eat. I could, I, it just, I wasn't absorbing it. Like I'm losing and I'm eating weight and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm eating good food and I'm losing weight. And at 97 pounds, I couldn't lose any more. So now I'd like to lose some weight for the first time in my life. So yeah. um, it's individual. It just like tapering is, is symptom-based. Mm -hmm. Everybody is different. Everybody doesn't eat right. They might, you know, have some bad habits. I've never had coffee or tea in my life. I don't drink alcohol. I didn't smoke. And yet this one little pill destroyed my life. So it did harm my gut. Now, did I feel anything that it harmed my gut? And also genetically, I've had the DNA test done. So I don't have good liver function. I never really could take anything. I couldn't even, you know, I tried drinking alcohol when I was younger. I, I didn't like it. I got drunk very easily. So that's a telltale sign of, you know, I don't metabolize stuff well. So when I went to um, the second functional medicine doctor, he was very good. He had said, you know, we're going to do everything slow. So a supplement that 
let's say somebody takes a supplement and they get deathly ill. Well, maybe they took too much of it. So he had me start off very, very slowly. So the second part, first I healed my gut, and the second part was then dealing with the liver. So I will, for the rest of my life, not every day, but every now and then I'll take stuff to assist the liver, not cleanse it. And um, I can tell when I need to do it. I will, ne and I, could, I try to do it with food. But every now and then, I will take a medical-based food very slowly. Every time I do it, I have to go on it slowly because too much will make me feel too sick. Yeah. That, honestly, I went to see a functional medicine doctor because I knew that both you and Holly Hardman had worked with functional medicine doctors at the point where I was, you know, a while out after my taper and just not doing great. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the first things he worked with me on was my gut. And obviously the nutrient deficiencies and the hormone balance, right? All of that just, they all go hand in hand. And right. absolutely, I, I mean, when people come to me for advice, that's one of the main things I tell them is start working with a functional medicine doctor if you can. But yeah. also, but don't, there's not, there's not that one thing that's going to solve all your it's problems. It's not right? that one thing. I would, yeah. That's why I never, you know, people say, why didn't you finish the book that you started? I was looking for the magic bullet. What's going to help us all? And the answer is, it just isn't one thing for all of us. It really is different for each one of us. So yeah. you have to be very careful with that. Somebody say, what did you take? What did you take to heal your gut? What did you take? But what I took, you know, could make you sick. So yeah, it, I know it, I do magnesium daily as well, but I know some people have been really severely ad adversely. Very sick. I saw somebody post one time that they took magnesium glycine and they got so ill. So yet for me, I take, still take two every morning when I get up. I take two every night when I go to bed. And keeps and if I'm under any stress, when my husband was sick, I took extra. I also, when my husband was very sick, I made sure I was taking a few natural things that I know are very calming for me, so I could stay on top of the stress. It's funny because somebody said once, "Oh, we heard you went on an antidepressant when your husband was sick." I'm like, "Yeah, I don't think so." Like, yeah, I was, right. I, I have to be dead, and they injected it into my body. I know. But I said, "No, I I never did." You know, taking a pill isn't going to change the fact that my husband had two kinds of cancer. So I dealt with it. I tried to make sure I took a little time for me. And I have to say, we, we used a lot of laughter. Laughter is wonderful. My niece was also sick at the time with cancer. And she said, get this book, um, it, Radical Remission. And so every time my husband and I would be in a Dana-Faba, you know, first when he was having radiation, and then, of course, we, he went from having... Merkel cell carcinoma too, we discover he's got leukemia. So everything is changing fast, fast, fast. And um, I would sit and read Radical Remission and laughter was a huge part of helping people heal. And so when you think about, um, when you go into events of withdrawal, what are we doing most of the time? We're crying, it's misery, we're reading horrible stories on the internet of other people. You know, look, even though I started the first support group and they are wonderful, you need to, get away from some of that you have to have some you, you kind of have to disconnect sometimes from all of that because yeah. a lot of it, it it promotes sort of the shame and the blame and the explain as i as you know i like to talk about it because you're constantly having to explain yourself and you're constantly feeling this shame or be you know like you or you need to put the blame on somebody else and not on yourself and it's like this constant battle that you're fighting to prove to legitimize that what you're going through is legit and it's mm -hmm. like just accept that it is and that not everybody is going to believe that for now. That's okay. Yeah. Right. And just work on healing yourself. And you know, you said the, the laughter thing. I, my husband and I, um, he started, uh, we started watching um, Psych on Netflix when I was mm -hmm. going through withdrawal. And I couldn't even watch TV uh, because yeah. of this. You, you know, it's hard to watch TV. It hurts. Yeah. But, it, it does. I yeah. react to every little thing with scary. So I watched a lot of the Food Network. Mm -hmm. And lifetime only net where I, I had to be, I couldn't even take noise. If I could get in a car, they couldn't even put the radio on. They couldn't talk. I'd say to the kids, don't talk. If you want me here, don't talk. I mean, yeah. that's how fragile I was. And then, you know, when you meet people and they say, oh, you were never sick. You couldn't have been sick. Like, okay, someday when you're better, people are going to say you weren't sick because you do get to the other side. You know, you do get there. I mean, now I'm up early in the morning. I'm usually, I, I couldn't go into a food store for years. I'm up, I'm gone, I'm here, I'm there. You know, life does come back. I never thought it would. And even though I was a slow healer and I saw all these other people in my support group come, taper, go back to work. Like, why am I still so sick? So I, 
again, in my getting ready to taper, I say what I do. I, and I am a firm believer. I don't know about you. If, if like if somebody came to me right now, I would say I would never take from a sick body. I had a sick body in the end from what the drugs did to me. I would take, minimum of three, but three to six months to get strong and healthier and start doing all that stuff first because I have seen <clears throat> where people have tried to taper and fail, go back on, try to taper, fail. I saw somebody do it four times, wow. but on the fourth time when they went back on, they built themselves up for one year, good food, at gentle exercise, supplements for their body, tapered, and I said, how did you do? Were you sick? Now, this time they had to come off a few meds. He said, maybe three uncomfortable days. This is the difference. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah it, it's so, that's so true. And, you know, at the same time, I think um, we, you know, when you're doing these, these multiple med tapers, I know for me, I had just recently gotten off Cymbalta and mm -hmm. I was just barely stable enough. I think just barely stable enough to start um, a taper, but I had been floxed twice like right before i started my taper and i didn't know that's what had happened to me right. so here i am being you know <laughs> being flossed and tapering at the same time it was just it was oh, just a bad. and then and have kids it's so hard it's so hard yeah yeah and then i'm five years out now myself mm -hmm. and really still healing in so many ways but other things you know it's like hard to know because i'm 42 and it's like okay what's being 42 and what was benzos and flocks but you know there are still there are still some things that i still deal with um yeah. you know i still have some teeth pain um and for whatever reason i'm going through my hair falling out again i go through these periods where I'm, like my hair just all falls out like it did during yeah. withdrawal and yeah. then hopefully like a little creature. Creature. it's a, that little creature in the tub when i would look and i go how do I have any hair left, you know? I did, oh, it's amazing. I know. <clears throat> but yeah, still healing, still healing, still getting so much better. Um, well, you know, one of the things I always say uh, when I'm speaking at the State House is that I have a need to always be safe and in control after what happened. I, will, I don't think I'll ever get over that. That is, I protect myself at all costs, you know? Um, I'm, and I'm not going to say I'm meticulous with my diet because you know what? When you get better... I just want to go out with my kids and my husband or, you know, with friends and enjoy myself. And I'm going to do that. You know, when I'm home, I'll eat as good as I can, you know? Yeah. But as far as, yeah. you know, what, I mean, it's funny. I got sick one time and the doctor's like, well, can I give you this? No. Nope. I don't know if you know, I, I fell in, uh, I fell back a few years ago and I broke my pelvis oh. and I thought, oh dear God, I'm not going to, I thought, but I, I thought I broke my hip. And I said to my husband, now here I have to go in an ambulance, which was like my biggest fear. And I'm like, oh, I was calm. I'm texting while I'm in the ambulance. I'm relaxed. And I'm, I said to my husband, just don't let them give me a benzo. I don't want anything. And so when I get there, it turns out I broke my pelvis. And it's very painful. And the doctor wanted to give me meds. I'm like, no. I said, so now you don't want to look a crazy person because who wouldn't want meds, right? Mm -hmm. So I just said, oh, you know, I'm just one of those people. I can never drink alcohol. I don't react good. I'm joking. I think I better joke about it because I learned that from another person. And so then I, I just said to him, you know what? Give me your most minor prescription you can. And, and I never filled it. But, you know, I suffered through the pain. And my sister who does pain management for a living, every day she'd call and say, you have to take something. I said, pain I can handle. I said, side effects from a drug? No, thank you. Don't want it. And so I called a friend that did homeopathy. I did homeopathy. I uh, got a, I had a biomat. I laid on that. I got in a uh, neurolumen that helps to heal faster. And I had physical therapy in the house. And I could walk in six weeks, no crutch, no walker, nothing. And I, and I couldn't even walk for a few weeks. I mean, they had to teach me to walk again. But in six weeks, I was healed. And my sister who broke hers four years before me went back to work three months later on one crotch, still on meds. Wow. So there's a difference. Even my physical therapist said, I cannot believe how fast you peel. Yeah. And so that's, that's I think head. your whole story is, is really the lesson to take from, for people to take from this is that number one, we, we really do put too much trust into these authority figures, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's doctors or whatever, we just, we, and we have so much, trust in them that we think that they've got the best way of doing things and it may not necessarily be and also number two there's a balance to life 
You know, right. but why is there no one pill? Because it's, it's about everything. It's about bringing right. everything into balance. It's about your gut. It's about balancing life with your kids and your husband. And I know, cause I made the same mistakes myself. Right. And you know, it's about balancing, you know, eating healthy and, and maintaining a regimen and also living life and, you know, just changing things up a little bit and doing things. Right. And we just protect ourselves in, in the best that we can. You yeah. know, I think you and I were talking earlier about teeth, you know, because again, my teeth moved from, uh, you know, from the benzos, thanks to benzos. And when I went and had braces put on five years ago, who would have thought, you know, that it, I got sick. They had to have them taken off. I cannot believe how sick I got. So do I call it a setback? No, I got sick from, she put nickel wires in my mouth. And then I had to kind of go back to functional medicine and clear that out. And um, we just have to, and I was so careful before I did it to make sure I thought I knew everything that was going in my mouth. So now I'm looking into Invisalign, but I'm nervous about it, to be honest, you know? Yeah, I know. That's why I haven't done anything because I, I know my teeth are so bright, you can't tell, but I, I have these teeth that keep getting more and more crooked and it started with, you know, the benzos and, um, yeah, it's, 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 you're reticent to try anything because I can't even chew gum. So like uh -huh. you said, it's not, they're not maybe setbacks, but it's like, we do have this level of sensitivity now. And right. there are things that, that now you react to And for me, like I was trying to figure out what was going on with me because I started chewing gum again, cause I could, mm -hmm. and cause we're wearing masks, you know, all the yeah. time and whatever. Right. And I'm like, why is my head vibrating again? Why am I getting this symptom oh. five years later? It was the gum. So then I switched to natural gum with xylitol and it's different, but now all of a sudden I'm getting these headaches and I'm like, why am I getting these headaches? Yeah. Does that, so guess what? Jocelyn, just and the teeth, you know? you know, I mean, so we're not the only ones that had teeth problems. There are others that had braces, they've had Invisalign, you see them on the group. And I mean, it's, it's crazy. Everything moves, you know? So it's like, got to protect ourselves at all costs. So I, you know, I had braces when I was a kid. I had straight teeth and now because of benzos, I have crooked teeth and it's so upsetting, you know? It but. is. It, it's, it's hard to get back to loving yourself. I think, mm. you know, because you want to go back to where you were because that was the person you loved. And now right. you have to learn to love this person who's got all these failing body parts and things going crazy and whatever, you know, <laughs> scars. I, know. I, I have scarring from the boils, you know? Um, it's hard, you know, but it's, it's an, for me, that was a crucial key to my healing, was learning yeah. to just accept myself. Do you feel myself. that in some ways you're back to the age when it all happened? Like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll want to do all these things when I was 33, and then I'll, and I'll have my kids say, oh, you were old, you're old, mom. I'm like, what? What do you mean? But I, I did, I got old through this whole process. Like I lost so much, you know? Yeah, Crazy. I want to go back to when my kids were younger. I'm like, wait, what happened to the age when my daughter was, in first grade and second, you know, and, and I'm like, I want to go back and do the things I would have done with her, right. you know, but we didn't, we didn't yeah. ever do that. It just kind of just passed me by. Oh, I, there was so much I didn't do with my kids because it's now, you know, speaking of kids, because, you know, we both have kids and we were sick while they were younger. I was very sick when my kids were younger. And we know that so many people have lost that communication with their, with their children, which to me is the most heartbreaking. You know, that they thought they were crazy. They don't talk to them anymore because of a drug they took. They were a good patient. So again, another reason why do we do what we do? Families are broken because of a drug. It, it's, it's just so wrong. It is. And, and every family that's broken, whether it's a divorce or the kids from their parents, you know, because the kid is on it or it's just heartbreaking. And, you know, I think you still interact with, it seems like with a lot of people on an individual basis, do, do people just I, kind of reach out to you or? I, you know, somehow they do find me. <laughs> I try to always be respectful because I'm very quiet on the groups. I don't write a lot. I'm very quiet. And um, I always like to do things more behind the scenes. And, um, but that's the whole point of the podcast. You know, when my son said, mom, you know, enough. I hear you saying the same things over and over to people. You got to do the podcast you know, put the stories out there and just, I can send them to this one story, that one story, you know, go listen to them, go listen to Dr. Stephen Wright, you know, go listen to this pharmacist when he's talking about different brands with different things that are in the brands that could be making you sick. Um, you know, that's more my goal now because it's, it's not fair to our families for people to want our time. Mm -hmm. 
and I do give it because I always say somebody answered the phone for me yeah. on the other end years ago when I called over to the UK, <clears throat> but I was very, very respectful of their time and never, you know, I wasn't looking for them to help me on a daily basis, but you know, we see that I almost see more desperation today. Do you with people yeah. sicker, more multi-drug? And that's something Heather Ashton said she could see out of the United States and Canada, the multi-drugging. She couldn't believe the multi-drugging coming out of these two countries. Yeah. And I think some of the desperation, I don't know if it's necessarily that people are more sick. I think they're more hopeless. Maybe it's just because they've been indoctrinated longer for years of like, you know, that, that this is your illness. And if the pills don't work for you, then you're kind of screwed because you're just going to be this way the rest of your life. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I don't think people have a lot of faith these right. days. And well, and one of the things people are telling them what to do, Every, what somebody, what you did is different than what I did. It's very individualized to get better. And you know, your first step is taking care of yourself. And when people want to jump in and they're sick and they're reading horror stories, that's, that's making them sicker. This is why my friend has been off for 40 years. I, I said to her, don't go on the support groups. If you have a question, ask me, you have a good doctor, everything lined up. Your family is supporting you now. That's so you know, true. I don't want her. Yeah. Read, I don't want her reading the horror stories, and she did for just a little bit. She's like, "Oh my gosh, you're right." I mean, so she can be out and doing things that she is not influenced by. Oh well, somebody said that if you do this, this is going to happen. She's not influenced by anything. And when she and I get together, we're not talking about benzos. It's it's socialization. It's getting together as two friends. And I understand that you're sick and you can't do a lot, and we don't bring up a lot of negativity. Yeah, that's true. I didn't think about that because I think people have more access now to more of those kinds of stories. I wasn't really exposed to that either. The support group I was in was just very like, it's just about tapering. It was just about giving support. I didn't hear, I mean, you heard what people were going through, but it wasn't these, I don't know. I, yeah, it wasn't, um, it didn't overwhelm me in light of all the success or the hope that was given to me in the support and saying, you're going to heal. Like, don't worry, you're going to heal kind of thing. Right. Right. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. And you never saw years ago, like when I did, you ever saw Trigger, you know, they do T R. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I understand they're sick. I mean, I get it, but now, so okay, which is great, because somebody can go right past this and not read it. But when I started the support group years ago, it was to bring in, I contacted others who had healed in other countries. Can you come into, you know, my group? We've got to give hope. That's really what I wanted, was hope. You know, hope is, is free. This is what we need. Um, yeah, and, and that's why I love, because basically your podcast is weekly, right? Well, you know, it can be. My son would like it weekly. Um, yeah. <laughs> and right now we are jumping on the weekly thing. But, you know, for the summer, I took the summer off. That was my time to go and get on the beach and relax and, and get the sun. Yeah. So, yeah, we are now trying to stay on the weekly. That's good. And because and I remember, oh, I can't remember his name now, from Mary Joy is Free he would do these weekly little hopeful videos. And I just remember, I didn't even, I didn't even know that until I was like done with my taper. I would have loved to have known that before because I think it's, it's so important for you to have sort of that regular contact with hope, with that, you know, with someone that you trust who can right. bring you that message of hope. And, you know, that's not what my channel is. I'm, I'm lucky if I get something out once a month, you know. <laughs> exactly. But, but exactly. for you to have something regular that people can look forward to, to hope yeah. for. You know, and to, I think that's just so brilliant. I, I just love that you're doing it. Yeah. And I, and at these, at the end, my son and I do a little banter. Um, I want people, first of all, he's, he's very good on it. And he's met so many of the Benzo people, especially when we're at the state house, you know, he knows all the Benzo people that come in, you know, and he, he was even as a young boy, he was very understanding of what I went through. We hid more from my daughter. Um, but yet she's the one that grew up to be a nurse. He grew up to be the lawyer. Um, and she, you know, has to give out benzos to people, but yet she also understands. But he's very kind, very understanding about it. And um, we try to do that banter at the end because we do know so many families have been broken up over this. And I hope that somebody will listen, you know, that he gets it. You know, he's, he did, I, I didn't lose my relationship with my children as others did. I did a, a show with Jennifer in North Carolina who her daughter does not speak to her anymore. Actually, quite a few of them. Um, there's there's um, seven relationships 
you know? So we like to let people know, hey, it is normal if your kids don't talk to you or if it's the child and a parent doesn't talk to them. Um, it's very sad. I mean, years ago, I got a call from someone and I, the son and the doctors actually told the parents, throw him out of the house. He is not sick from clonopin. And thank God the son could go find information on the internet. And then brought, somehow my phone number used to be out there, brought it to his parents and his mother called me <clears throat> and they brought him home. They fed him. They took care of him. He recovered. Wow. But, but it took, you know what I mean? Here she went to doctors at Duke University who said, throw him out. Wow. And they did. And then he had to bring information. So what we do, uh, it does take away from our families. And then when we cover, it takes away from our time. So there's still a way I can give back, you know, by doing the podcast weekly, or even if I decide now Christmas is coming up, we're going to get out this one that's, I think, going to be fantastic, the 30th one. And um, I might tell my son I'm taking a break till after Christmas, but we'll see, you know, because I have so many that we want to do. Like I've had a list for, when well, we put them out, I had a list and then I was gone for a year because as soon as we put the four out, the first four, then we found out my husband had the cancer. So there went a year, you know, so, and that's the beauty of this. Our families come first. So I can walk away for a year. I can walk away from whatever, but even though you're gone for a year, people are still contacting you, you know? Yeah. So you do it as, as kindly and as nicely as possible. Yeah. And yeah, I totally get that. And I, sometimes I have to step away for various reasons or, you know, but I still answer people basically daily on, yeah on my channel, but it's like, you know, but I don't, I, I, I often have to tell people the, I look, I can't do like one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like I can answer things and I can do it like in my time, but I, I've spent way too much, many years where I was just giving them all my time and attention. And then my husband is like, okay, like you're not even like fully present with us anyway, because you're sick. And now you're giving, I mean, that's, that was just so hard. So after yeah. like 33 years, you know, there are so many people who have gone on, they've moved on with their lives. They, 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 they just want to live their lives. Right. And, and then I don't blame them it's at true. all. Right. right. But why, right. why do you keep doing this? Why still keep going 33 years later? So 33 years later, it's like you got into the mafia and they don't let you out. You know, like I, I've tried to disappear <laughs> and, and you can't. Somebody brings you back in and, you know, like you, I might get a message uh, or an email or because I'm still doing the Ashton Man, you know, I have all the books on Benzo Book Review. I can't walk away because of that yet. And I, you know, I do want to retire from it all. So, you know, I, I'm probably going to take the next year to get ready to see where all that's going to go. And um, I want to make sure it's well taken care of. And, and even then, it's hard to disappear. You know, um, how do you disappear? Because they're going to find you no matter what. Um, and, you know, I think and it's, it's good to show hope, but with so much going on with these organizations, like I said, I would love to see the goal someday of a little mini tranks in every hospital where you can go and you actually, and it should be covered under your health insurance. Nobody should have to pay out of pocket. You know, health insurance paid to put you on these drugs. They should be paying for the support for you to recover until you recover, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that is one of the goals of the Alliance is to work through that system within that system to get the patients they help they need so that it's not all on us to do everything ourselves from tapering right. to recovery. Right. And because when you recover, you should be able to enjoy your life. People say, oh, I, when I recover, I'm going to do what you do. I said, nope, enjoy your life. Leave your letter behind, leave your story behind, leave something behind. Um, but if somebody needs you for a little bit, sure, I may call you and say, I have somebody just like you. Would you talk to them? And they do, but I, you don't want to interfere with their lives. It's, it's really important to go on with your life. I see some that I'm friends with on Facebook. They are out having wonderful lives. Some have gone on to become nurses, have, get married, have children. Those are the wonderful stories that you want to see, you know, and they shouldn't have to be dragged back in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, Geraldine, I mean, we could, I could talk to you for hours, but <laughs> I don't want this to get too long. Um, so I will just um, kind of end with this little question here for you. I'm going to throw mm -hmm. it out at you. Um, at the end of the day, after seeing this for so long and seeing the same thing over and over again, quite frankly, what gives you hope? 
Is there anything that gives you hope? So what gives me hope is the new website that you're involved with at benzoreform.org. Uh, what gives me hope is you know, to see BIC, what they're doing, to see all the uh, documentaries that are out and coming out, that more is going to happen. Um, and I think, you know, with the FDA black box warning, that was big, you know, now let's see what's gonna happen with that. And I think once the medical profession takes on what we've been doing, then we should be able to really walk away and know we did good. At the end of the day, did we do good with our lives? Yeah, you did. I think you've been an angel in, in so many people's lives. And um, it, even just with getting the Ashton Manual out there, how- I know, if we didn't have that to this point, um, Heather was so giving and, and anyone when I interviewed them on the podcast who knew Heather I try to have them say what she was like because a lot of people didn't have the opportunity to talk to her truly the most genuine person you ever want to talk to I wish every doctor was like her no oh, so that would, yeah then we would have we wouldn't have this problem <laughs> yeah <laughs> true <laughs> really well thank you so much Geraldine for thank agreeing to do this interview for oh, my channel okay. Yeah, I look forward to, I'm so glad we got a chance to finally sit down and chat because it's like we've, we move in the same circles and we kind of email or do things, but we've never. And, and I'm going to be getting you on the podcast too. So we'll be going full circle around. Okay. You can <laughs> turn right, the right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.